Oh, hello? Hello, Benjamin. It's Katie. We can hear you. Oh. If you just pop yourself on mute right. for a sec, then, um, yeah, you're okay. back in the room. It's all good. Thank you. I can't see anybody. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. We've all just got our cameras off at the minute, just as we're getting ready to start. Okay. See you in a second. Most people think that diversity is about race, but it's actually about having different views, different ideas, and having different experiences. Also, it doesn't matter where the author's from, but it actually matters about what the author's writing about and the narrative. I think diversity in English literature is something that reflects a balance of gender, um, a balance of race, um, a balance of issues. One author could write about one idea from one perspective, but then another author could write it from a different perspective. For me, um, diversity in English literature is all about integration and representation. I think every single background race should be represented in um, English literature, and we should have the opportunity to study that. Diversity is crucial in order to keep our students engaged and keen on reading the relationship between reading for pleasure and academic achievement is really very significant. So it's important that students have access to a range of texts that they're going to love, not just study. Diversity is important to me because it's easier to engage and enjoy the book whilst there is diversity in it, otherwise the book just is boring and harder to connect with literature is the study of what it means to be a human being and human beings are infinitely complex and diverse and therefore especially in a diverse nation like Great Britain we really should be looking at that full range of human experience. I'm very passionate about reading and I think everyone should be able to find a book that they love and should have the opportunity to be able to find a book that they want to read so I think it's very important that we have this wide range of books to choose from so we can all actually find what we enjoy instead of having this sort of snapshot of English literature. At Bristol Free School, 25% of us are BAME students. So if we come to Europe learning about English literature and English culture and we only get to see one side of it, the one side that white people write, then we're not getting the full experience and if we uh, are influenced by this we could uh, possibly see English literature as only this subject and not uh, what it truly is because English literature can be anything you want it to be it can be about you as a human for our students to read and understand about different lives and about their own lives is very important for them to understand their communities and the world around them. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you will know how to participate in today's event. If you're having connection problems, you will probably notice that the sound is breaking up or frequently cutting out. And if this happens, the first thing to do is refresh your page by pressing Control F5 or clicking on the refresh symbol next to your menu bar. This will often reestablish your connection and improve things. All of the windows you see on the screen are movable and resizable. You will also be able to access any of the windows on the screen via the menu bar at the bottom of the page. If you hover over the icon, you will see the window name. 
You will also have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter anytime by typing your questions into the Q&A box, which is located to the left of the slides on your screen. You can also use the same Q&A box for assistance in case you encounter any technical issues in viewing or listening to the webcast content. You can also interact with the presenter and other attendees via the group chat, which is the comic bubble option beside the question mark down at the bottom menu. Please make sure that you have this window open for the entire duration as there will be several instances that the speaker may interact with you every now and then. Lastly, you can use the resource list to click on the links that are available for you at the bottom left of your screen. Please note today's webinar is being recorded and will be available an hour after the live session using the same link to join this webinar. I'd now like to hand over to our presenter for today, Katie Lewis. Thank you. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited to have so many people joining us this afternoon. My name is Katie Lewis, and I'm the head of English Drama and Modern Foreign Languages at Pearson Ed Excel. I'm just going to kick off our webinar on diversity in literature um, by just giving a little bit of a brief recap about where we are currently in terms of the variety of literature that students um, have available to them for GCSE, um, where the um, basis of those um, inclusions and exclusions has kind of come from and some of the work that we've been doing to address that. Um, we're then very, very excited to be able to um, have Professor Benjamin Zephaniah with us. So we'll have the opportunity then to, to talk with him about um, Refugee Boy and his poem, We Refugees, which are now part of the Pearson Ed Excel English Literature Specification. And we also have um, Lauren Binks with us, who is the, uh, a teacher from uh, Townley Grammar School who's going to talk to us about the work that she has done with her department on decolonizing their curriculum. So hopefully you're going to get lots of chance to um, get some tips, get some ideas, and think about ways in which you may be able to refresh your curriculum so that um, some of those points that the amazingly uh, articulate children from Bristol Free School were sharing with us in our introductory video. Um, so I will... Um, uh, just crack straight on. So um, one of the things that we always need to think about, obviously, is the context in which all of these conversations are going on. So in 2017, the Royal Society of Literature did a survey and they asked 2,000 people to name a person or people that they um, believed were writers of literature. So to give examples, names of uh, famous literary figures. Now, um, of the 400 writers who were named by those 2,000 people, only 7% of them were from um, black, Asian, or minority ethnic backgrounds, which just gives you a kind of sense of the scale of the, um, I guess, the presumption that um, literature, writers of literature, come in a certain sort of size or shape. Um, so then who does create that size and shape of the English curriculum? We've obviously got a, a range of different people who are accountable and responsible for making the decisions that take us to where we are today. So the Department for Education obviously produces a subject content, and that's a subject content that all awarding organisations have to adhere to. Um, we then research and develop those qualifications um, and make sure that those are meeting the requirements of the regulator who ultimately um, accredit them. We do that in collaboration with subject experts for researching and reviewing. We do it in collaboration with our senior examining team who create the sample assessment materials. We also do it in consultation with teachers, um, obviously finding out what it is they would like to see. The one part of that kind of ladder that tends not to be included particularly is the points of views of students. And I think historically we've always kind of thought that it's difficult to ask a student what books they would like to see or what content they would like to see because how do they know what options are out there? But I think certainly the context of recent weeks and months and indeed years has shown us that students are massively engaged with the kind of content they want to see on their curriculum. And to um, not listen to them or to not ask their opinion is, is a real oversight in the development of qualification content. The other aspect which I think is really important and that we're going to get on to uh, a little bit today is that an education is not just... Um, something which 
comes without any sort of political or um, social bias. So the content of any education, including an English literary education, as um, Raymond Williams has kind of said here, it's unconsciously and consciously uh, reproducing certain basic elements in the culture. So it is, in fact, this is a selection. It's things which are included and things which are excluded. Um, it's not something which occurs sort of naturally or by, um, or by default. So the criteria that make those selections, those inclusions and those omissions are, of course, the Department for Education's um, literature criteria to, for 2015. And it really was um, focused very much on, I think, quite traditional and quite kind of canonical, um, somewhat, um, I was going to say old fashioned, <laughs> don't think anyone from the DfE is listening, so we're probably OK, uh, interpretation of what a, a rounded literary education would be. So we've got things about classic literature. We've got things about the literary heritage. We've got the requirement that students study texts from the British Isles. So at least one play by Shakespeare, at least one 19th century novel, really amping up the heritage aspect of English literature, um, representative romantic poetry. And we do have this requirement for fiction or drama must be from the British Isles and must be from 1914 onwards. So when we look at the text which are then included on um, GCSE English literature, before we added our four new texts and our new poetry collection in July of last year, the text that you can see on your screen there are the ones that were on the Pearson Edexcel specification. I'm going to let you guess which one was the most popular before I bring up the statistics. So you just have a little think about it. Which one of those texts do you think the majority of learners in 2019, 2020 are engaging with? And the answer is an inspector calls. And I know it should go without saying, but this is not an attempt by me or us or anyone to say that they shouldn't study Shakespeare, they shouldn't study Dickens, there's anything wrong with an inspector calls. But I think it probably tells us something that the most modern of these texts was written in 1996, which to me <laughs> seems really contemporary. Um, but to the students, of course, is literally a whole lifetime away. So just before we move on to um, the next stage of our presentation, I just wondered how this resonates with what you're doing in your classrooms currently. So we have a poll for you. If you could please select from this list which of those texts you're currently teaching um, for your um, contemporary text option. And then we'll see how well you're aligned with the rest of the country. Okay, so let's have a look at what you are all doing. So, very much like um, everywhere, the main and most popular text here is uh, Our Inspector Calls. Uh, poor old Hobson's choice is no one's choice, it seems. Um, and then you can see there what some of the some of those other results are. Obviously, if you're with a different awarding organisation, perhaps your text is not listed. Um, so I'm going to uh, move very quickly on then as to why um, awarding organisations make quite safe and predictable choices around things like text selection um, to our um, discredit sometimes. So partly because we're competing in a kind of um, market where we want to um, appeal to centres by giving them something that they know, something they're familiar with. Also because we know that that's what the regulator wants a lot of the time. And to try and do something different runs the risk of, you know, having to have difficult conversations about whether something is um, meeting those criteria that I highlighted earlier. Um, I'm going to skip slightly through the teacher content because you know what all of your pressures are. You know that it's easier and safer, perhaps, and there are financial constraints on making new text choices that can sometimes leave you almost kind of trapped in a cycle of teaching a text that you know doesn't necessarily um, represent or reflect the literature you want to expose your students to. 
Um, so as a first step, about three or four years ago, we added some um, guides to our A-level coursework options. Now, the reason that I mention these here is because I am aware that some schools have decided to use these guides to help inform a more diverse Key Stage 3 curriculum. So in case you're not aware of these, because they have been pitched at Key Stage 5, um, they are available on our website. I've put the link in there so you can go and find them. There's one on Black British literature. There's one on British Asian literature. And there's an LGBT plus guide also. And they give you lots of examples of text and um, teaching tips for if you want to incorporate those texts into your classroom. But putting something on as an option isn't really the same as putting it on a specification. You put something on a specification, you're making that selection that we talked about in that quotation earlier. You're saying that these texts are, they have parity. We have Shakespeare, we have Dickens, and we have other texts which are in that same kind of, um, we, so you sort of bestow upon them a kind of value, I suppose, which is, again, something we should really kind of critique and talk about. So last July, we added the four texts you can see there and a poetry collection onto our new specification. I'm very, very excited to tell you that this afternoon we have with us um, Professor Benjamin Zephaniah, who wrote the original novel of um, Refugee Boy, which was adapted for the stage by Lem Cisse. Um, Benjamin, if you're there and you can hear me, can you turn your webcam and your microphone on and then everybody can say hello? Well, hello. I think my webcam... Hello. Can... <laughs> Hello, hi. Yes, I can see you. I can see you. I'm assuming that you can see me as well. I can, yes. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We're really, really delighted and I'm very lucky to have you with us. Um, what I'll just do is I'll just let the um, delegates know if you've got any questions that you'd like me to um, ask, feel free to put those into the Q&A box and then um, I'll try and keep an eye on those and then we can we can talk about those. Um, but I just wondered if maybe we kick off with our with our conversation. I don't know if you saw the video of the children who were talking at the start of the event about literature and how they want to feel engaged and how they want to feel inspired. And I know you said before that you weren't really a reader when you were a teenager yourself. You found that a real challenge. I just wondered if we could kind of kick off by talking about, you know, your own experiences perhaps of reading when you were at school. Well, if you don't mind, I'd just like to start by saying that I found those students, what they said, really refreshing. Yeah. The reason why, I, I kind of... When I hear the word diversity, normally, I am very careful because usually it comes from big organisations. And when I hear big organisations saying we need to be more diverse, I think, what is the other side of that kind? What's another way of putting that? And it usually means you need to be less racist, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's very difficult for an organisation to say, we need to be less racist, so they say, we need to be yeah. more diverse. And I think, that, yeah. to a certain extent, the term can be hijacked. And I think what those students were talking about is real diversity. It's interesting that they, it wasn't just about race, it was about so many other things. And so yeah. for me, that, that was like a breath of fresh air, because that's what diversity means to me. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's I think it's absolutely right that we all we, me, as a as a person who works in a large organization, have to acknowledge our own failings in not having listened to and engaged with those children as part of bringing the qualification, and the content together, because exactly that they had such a kind of easy and refreshing understanding of what that meant and what what they wanted to see that to not make them part of the conversation is an is a real omission. And you're kind of cutting yourself off from such good good insight? When I had a very... My education wasn't great. Um, I yeah. suffered from dyslexia very badly. And at the time, I didn't even know it was called dyslexia. I didn't know what it was. So I struggled to read anyway. But I love stories, which is really weird. But the stories were told by my mother from elders in the Caribbean community they wanted to make a point so they would embellish in a Nancy story or something like that. But I do remember <laughs> being in school one day and um, a teacher talking about poets and writers. And they were all, seriously, they were all dead 
white men. And yeah. I, happen, I happen to mention that I like the work of a woman, a woman that just happened to be white. I said, what about Mary Shelley? And the teacher said, oh, she just wrote things to scare people. <laughs> <laughs> As if it wasn't serious literature, you know? And I think Shelley yeah. um, Frankenstein is one of the greatest books of all time. Um, mm. But, and so even, even uh, although that wasn't about colour, it was about a lack of diversity. And, to, and, you know, to be frank, it was a female teacher that was talking about the female writer like that. Um, yeah. When I was in school, I had very little literature. And when I struggled to engage with it, I was just called stupid, sit in the corner, all that kind of stuff. But I didn't yeah. let it kill my love of, of, of storytelling, however it came to me. Uh, be that mm. by record, be that by you know tapes you would get from Jamaica, be that from by my elders, or sometimes I used to love. <laughs> it's interesting. I cannot remember almost anything about World War Two that I learned at school. Yeah. But as a little boy, I used to sit down with old soldiers and let them talk to me. And when I compare what they said to. <laughs> What I later learned was in being taught in schools, I thought it was so different because what they told me wasn't glamorous at all. It was horrible. Mm. It was mm. bloody. It was suffering. Yeah. It was pain. Mm. It was fear. Mm. They didn't see themselves as heroes going into battle. You know, they were yeah. scared young kids. Mm. Uh, yeah. And so yeah. I, I, I am obsessed with going to people and listening to their stories. And if we can capture those stories in literature, then I, I think we can really have a better representation of what our country is and what our people are. And is that the kind of thing that you then try and sort of pull forward into your own writing then? So when you're writing Refugee Boy, for example, is that sort of experience of representing different stories and different points of view something that you try and, that you try and draw on? Well, <laughs> um, there's one thing that you don't find writers doing very often, but I'm going to do it now, and I'm going to talk about my editor. I have an right. editor called Emma Mac. I love her very much, you know. Uh, she kind of made me into a novelist, if you like. Um, kind of famous in the industry because she edited all the Harry Potter books, but at the same time she was doing them, she was doing my books as well. And she used to talk about how different they were, you know, Harry, Harry Potter being fantasy land and my stuff being like... And it was, she edited some of my poetry when I was at Puffin Books. And she went to Bloomsbury and said to the people at Bloomsbury, she wanted to publish Benjamin Zephaniah as a novelist. Now, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about Refugee Boy. I'm going to talk about another novel. That's fine. Soon. No, that's absolutely fine. That's fine. Mm. Mm. So she said, um, Benjamin, we'd like to publish you as a novelist. And I really wasn't sure. Um, I resisted for a while, but I used to tell her stories and she said, Benjamin, you're full of so many stories about your youth. You know, you'd make, you'd be a good novelist. So one day I stood in front of her and I went, no, I'm, 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 I'm not a novelist. I'm a poet. I was mm. born a poet. I'm a guy, a poet. And she said, Benjamin, here's a check. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but she said, look, I will, will give you an advance go away, start writing. If it works, great. And if it doesn't work, oh. so be it. Yeah. And do you mind... think... go on. Sorry, I was just wondering, you know, because you were saying you didn't sort of think of yourself as a novelist. Is that any relation to the fact that you hadn't kind of seen examples of people like yourself being novelists? Or was that more about your own lack of kind of confidence in in kind of you know where you talk about the dyslexia and so on i actually think it was a bit of both i never thought about the first part you made um did i read any black novels no i mean i i, I read some kind of black philosophers like marcus garvey and i used to love angela davis remember that freedom fighter from the black power movement but those were they weren't novels um but um when i went away to write a novel this face. Again, it, it relates to something one of the students said earlier um, about 
I can't remember exactly what she said. I can't remember if it was a she or a he, but it was about, again, it's about diversity. A good story is a good story. It doesn't matter who it's written by, something like that. Um, hmm. Somehow it got out in the press that I was going to write a novel, and I could see the press predicting a Black Brixton novel, a novel, a novel right. that's edgy, and it's going to be about black youth in, in Hansworth or Brixton or Tottenham or something like that. And I thought, you know, they're expecting me to do something. I've been writing about sexism and racism all my life. And I thought, right, mm. I want to show them that I can wrote, write. So I wrote a book called Face, which was about a 14-year-old white kid who loses right. his face in a car crash. And it's about how his yeah. face is rebuilt and then how he has to face the world. And I'm very proud of that book because it's not a, a black book as such. It's a book about a 14-year-old white kid, but it's about identity and it's about discrimination and it's about how people see us. We all can't mm. be black, we can't all be gay, we can't all be straight, we can't all be Asian, we can't all be white, but we all mm. have a face. And one of the first yeah. things we do in the morning is we look at it in the mirror and then we mess mm. around with it. And, uh, <laughs> Precious to us, you know. What happens when it's taken away from you? Now, that can happen to anybody, regardless of your sexuality, regardless of your race. And so I want to explore discrimination. I call it facial discrimination. Mm. And, um, and one of the yeah. first things I do, one of the first things I did, and this comes back to Refugee Bar and the other things I've written, is I didn't say, oh, let me study this subject. Let me now go and do my research. I thought there was a 14-year-old boy once upon a time called Benjamin Zephaniah who hated reading. Mm. He loved storytelling, mm. but he didn't like reading. When he saw a book, the first thing he looked at was the size of the book. And then he looked at hard work. But what would this Benjamin Zephaniah like to have read? What would have enticed him into reading? What would have turned him on to reading? Yeah. And that's when I start. I start from there. What would the young mm. Benjamin Zephyr have read? And that's how I wrote mm. Face and Gangster Rap was about music and hip hop and refugees. I was living in East London. I was surrounded by refugees. Mm. Every other kid I knew had a refugee background. And I just thought these young people are not covered in literature. And there was a lot of mm. talk on the media at the time about refugees but it was always adult refugees and i was talking to young yeah. kids who were refugees and listening to their stories and i thought mm. you know i had to say something about this so sorry for rambling um, on a bit but that's no not at came. all um, it remind it reminded me of something that i thought was extraordinary when we added these texts onto the specification these five new kind of collections um a year ago there was an article in i think it was the daily mail and it said, GCSE English literature gets gritty. And I thought, what a ridiculously reductive um, headline, because there's nothing inherently gritty about the range of texts which has been included. You know, we've got The Empress, which is set in Victorian London. We've got Quorum Boy, which is set in the like 1700s. We've got oh. Refugee Boy. We've got um, Boys Don't Cry, a whole range and spectrum of different experiences and different stories. But like you were saying about that expectation that you were going to write this kind of Brixton urban novel from a black perspective, you know, last year, they're still taking that same... I just thought that was a really, um, really interesting angle that they decided to take on it. But I just wanted to ask, oh, that was just me rambling on for a bit, sorry. I just wanted to, to ask you then, you know, you were saying about Refugee Boy, was there anything about the kind of Ethiopia-Eritrea conflict that inspired you to, to use that as your context specifically? Or was it just about finding a kind of contemporary sort of background setting or? It was the latter. I had actually spent some time living in Yugoslavia. And when I, saw right. Yugoslavia, when I saw Yugoslavia fall apart, I just couldn't believe it because I knew that country quite well. It's a very long story, and I smile when I say this, but it's absolutely true. I was a Yugoslavian millionaire. <laughs> um, I earned a lot of money in Yugoslavia, which they wouldn't let me take out, so I went to Yugoslavia to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I had, I had over there of all places. So I was in Yugoslavia mm. and I made lots of friends and I didn't understand 
And I think a lot of them didn't understand anything about their ethnicities and that stuff. I mean, they were just Yugoslavians. Mm. And then suddenly the country fell apart. And I'll never forget going to a couple, a friend of mine, and saying, you know, how are you getting on? How is your wife? And he said, we're not together anymore. She's a Croat and I'm a Serb. And I was like, so you were in love, weren't you? But no, no, mm. no, our communities won't tolerate that. And I just, I was just so shocked by that, you know? So mm. when it, I wanted to write about refugees, but yeah, I wanted a backdrop. And I knew Ethiopia because I'd spent some time there also. And I knew about the conflict on, with Eritrea. So I thought it would be good, it, it would just be a good backdrop. And also, I, I didn't want it to be about war as such. So mm -hmm. um, the first, in, in the novel, the first couple of pages that happen before the story starts are two identical pages. One is in Eritrea, one is in Ethiopia. And it's about discrimination in both countries, with mother in one instance and father in the other, saying, look, it doesn't matter where we come from, we're Africans, we're human beings. And then the story gets started kind of more or less in England. I didn't want it to be a war story. You know, I wanted it to be mm -hmm. somebody, the product of love. And that love just happens yeah. to come from two people who are born on different sides of a border. Yeah, and um, and that puts this child in a very difficult position. And also that idea, I think, that you can be born on the wrong side of a border before that border even exists. You know, like you're yeah. saying about Yugoslavia. You know, you don't even have a border, and then suddenly you're on the wrong side of it, um, and it's completely beyond your control. But I think also, in well, a way, kind of slightly made me think of your We Refugees poem, because that, again, was about, well, this could be anyone, this could be anywhere. It could be anyone. You, you could be brought, born in a country, raised in a country, you think it's your country, and then, because of some men in some suits uh, disagreeing, yeah. the country disappears. The country just disappears. Yeah. I yeah. mean, what can that be like? It, it, it's hard to imagine. Um, and so we know that... The, the idea of the nation state is quite a modern one of having flags and rigid borders. We are human beings, so how do we negotiate these these fake borders? They are all fake. Um, mm. I do this thing with my band on stage. I don't know if anybody watching has seen me with my band, but I do this thing, I love doing it at the end, where I kind of shout out to the audience, anybody here from Manchester? And they go, yeah. Anybody here from Birmingham? Anybody here from Ireland? Yeah. Any Nigerians in the house? Any Jamaicans in the house? And then I go, it's all rubbish. <laughs> we are one <laughs> people. There are yeah. all illegal immigrants. There are only illegal borders. You know, yeah, and I, I remember absolutely. I and I think, and I think that comes through really. I think that really does come through in the novel as well. In like um, Alem's father's kind of like this this thing, his his repetition of the idea. You know, are you Eritrean? Are you Ethiopian? He's saying I'm African. We we're human beings trying to look bigger and look at that kind of bigger picture of of a person's humanity as opposed to their sort of geography, as it were. But I did um, want to ask you. I did wonder because. Um, um, Alem in the book, he's really a studious boy. You know, he's really into reading. He's really into going to school. Um, I thought it was quite interesting in the in the context of English literature, which is kind of what we're talking about and the specification and all those kind of things. He reads Great Expectations from cover to cover and 1984 and things like that. And I wondered what the kind of motivation, just because you were thinking about, you know, you were saying young 14-year-old Benjamin Zephaniah, what would he have like to read perhaps i just wondered what why alan was a, such a sort of studious boy who loved reading so much because i came across so many refugees that young kid refugees that were here i mean i'm so lucky to have freedom and have an education and they just right <laughs> i'm not careful how i word this but they kind of worked harder than mm. also you know what i mean because they didn't take their education for granted they were like mm. wow i got an education and i'm going to work at it there are two people mm -hmm. I dedicate the novel to, um, Miriam and Derija, uh, at the beginning of the novel. Um, and um, they were two real kids, obviously, that I met and I spoke to. Um, and they were left in the hotel by their father. Um, so it's not their story, but I listen to them a lot, and then I listen to other refugees. 
Um, mm. And they really studied. One of them came with no English at all. And within a couple, about 18 months, he was like addressing assembly and stuff like that at school because he'd worked so hard and understand. And I asked him about it and he said, I used to sit down and he heard about all these great English classics and he read them all. And, <laughs> and he was comparing mm. them to Ethiopian classics and things like that, you know? Yeah. Things that the average British kid, black or white or Asian, wouldn't do. But because they were refugees, they felt he had to catch up and he had to do well. Um, so that's why I had Alam as, a, as somebody that read a lot and was interested in literature. Yeah, and I guess he's a teenage character because you he you know you were sort of representing the the teenagers that you'd met and the refugees that you'd met and kind of a sort of way of telling their stories, but in a sort of fiction a fictionalized way. Yes, and you know something's just come to mind. This is uh, I, again I've got to be careful. How I say this is this is you know <laughs> the truth, um, and I know there's lots of teachers listening, but I used to had this old classic car and just like a lot of blokes on a Sunday I'd be out there cleaning it and I used to see this little boy watching me all the time and at the end of my road there's a school and one day a friend of mine a teacher said to me do you know who this boy is and I said no he just watches me all the time I think he just likes the car and he just watches me. <laughs> so he said oh in school he's not paying much attention and we have a problem with him so I thought, that's interesting. And one day, as I was clean, doing working on my car, I called him over. I said, I need some help. Can you help me? And I got him to help me pick up a battery or something like that. And I started talking to him. And I found that he was a refugee from Sri Lanka. Honestly, I won't tell you what happened to his mother and his father. It was horrific. And he witnessed mm. it. And then a gun mm. was put to his And he was told to run. And if he was there when they counted to 10, they were going to shoot him. And he ran into the bush. Right. Some people picked him up and they said, we can turn you into like a rebel fighter or we can send you in exile. And he said, I don't want to see any more war when in exile. And he ended up in East London. Mm. And I, and I've missed out a lot of his story. But when I heard his story, yeah. I went back to my teacher friend and I said, he's not being naughty. <laughs> he's not <laughs> just not paying attention. He's traumatised. Yeah. You know? And then when they learned yeah. that, it was really interesting because the whole way they approached this young boy changed because they realised he was traumatised and he was staying with a foster mm. family who were mm. kind-hearted but didn't really understand the trauma that he had gone through. Yeah. So I just want to make that point. Yeah. Mm. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about, because obviously Refugee Boy was the novel and you were the you were the author of the novel and we talked a little bit about the kind of background and the process for that, but then it was adapted for the stage um, by Len yeah. Cisse. And I just wondered how that came about, that that, that adaptation happened and, and how it came about that Lem Cisse was, was the one to do that. Is that something that, like a choice of your own or do people sort of choose that for you? No, the, the Yorkshire Playhouse approached me and said, um, would I write it as a play? And I said, no. I like, when other people, I like when other people come in and just do something different with my work. Because um, I'll be too precious. I'll want to keep all the elements. And, um, and you know, I, I, I have to confess that um, I... Well, I'm just I'm repeating myself. I just take so much care about all the elements that when I see it kind of changed, um, and, it, and and if it works, it works. But in my mind, I still have the original in my mind, you know. Um, yeah. So anyway, I said, look, I don't want to do it. And originally, I said, can you get a new young writer to do it? I want to give the, a young writer because by then it was kind of. I was going to say established, but, you know, people had knew, knew about it. Um, yeah. But I wanted a, a young writer to have the opportunity to do it. And then Lem, every time I have a novel come out, Lem reads it and calls me and gives me his thoughts on it. And um, <laughs> he'd, already, he'd already done that with Refugee Boy. But then he came to me and he said, Benjamin, I have to do this. And he kind of said, look, it's partly my story. 
And I thought about yeah. it and I went, yes, you're right. And um, mm. so Len went with it and it was, you know, I, I let him have free reign. He did show me a couple of drafts and we did talk about it. Um, but uh, that's how it happened. But how does that feel, though? Because you mentioned if you were doing it yourself, you'd be too kind of wedded to maybe sticking with the original idea. But do you get kind yeah. of like proprietorial, like, you know, stop messing with my characters? Or does it feel quite kind of interesting to see those characters from somebody else's perspective? Again, the latter. You see, <laughs> I, when, I was writing, when I was writing the novel, and I kind of do this in my novels, in all of them I've done this, there's very little poetry in them. There's a poem mm. at the end of the book. Within the story, it's a straightforward narrative. And I think what Lem did, Lem put the poetry back into it. Um, right. So, you know, the, the play is very poetic. Um, mm. I, I, I think the difference is um, that with the novel, you can see the minute detail of how a child is processed in the detention centers and all those kind of things. Um, you can see the way that they are questioned in court and the, 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 just the, the detail of the trauma that they're going through. In Len's version, you have a poetic interpretation of this which is yeah. just as valid, I believe, just as valid. Mm -hmm. But mm. it's, it's uh, I've seen a couple of people put on the play, a couple of schools put on the play from the same book, and it's been quite different the way they've set it up. Although the words are the same, the way they're performed mm. is different. It's a bit like the difference between, depending on where it's performed, the difference between me performing it and... Um, uh, that, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm thinking of uh, Michael Rosen or somebody like that. Mm -hmm. you know, same work, mm -hmm. a different approach. So that's a great mm -hmm. thing with what led to it. You know, he's opened it up broader. Mm. Were there any parts of the adaptation where you thought, you know, I wouldn't have done it like that, or even made you think, oh, I could have done that in the novel originally, almost kind of second guess what you'd done from the beginning? Is it? Do you ever get that feeling? Well... There's a there's a there's a point in the book where um, sorry in the in the play where mm. when I'm watching it I'm slightly embarrassed and everybody laughs <laughs> in the audience but me it's where yeah. where Alan is has got this idea he's gonna get a demonstration and he's gonna get he's gonna get this Rasta poet you know this Rasta poet that does this Jamaican style and it's obviously me <laughs> the whole audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but but no, I, I think if, if there was something I didn't like, I would have said. Yeah. And, and if there was something I wanted to write, I would have wrote. Right. You know. Yeah. Um, it's really, I, honestly, I could, I could talk to you about this for hours and hours, honestly. Um, but I wonder if, just for the last um, few minutes, maybe if I can pick some questions that have been coming in from some of the, some of the, some of the people who are with us this afternoon. Um, so one of the questions that we've had coming through, and you have to excuse me, question submitters, because we've had so many through, I might not necessarily um, get everybody's names or everybody's questions in, but we've had a question in from... I don't think I can say your full name for data reasons, but Peter, I'm going to call you Peter W. So Peter W asked, are you more hopeful about the state of literature study in light of recent protests and a clear mandate from young people for change? Are you feeling more kind of hopeful, I guess? I am. And it's not just because of Black Lives Matter. Now, um, and you know, you, you know that I'm not saying this because I'm talking to you, but we no. spoke about diversity in literature and we had planned an event prior to all this, yes? yes. Yeah. You know, and I've been telling yeah. people that. They say, you know, yeah. in literature, and I say, literally, I've been talking to people about this and we've had something planned anyway, right? Yes. So, mm. I'm not saying this just to be... Um, um, 
I can't quite think what the word is now, um, sycophantic to you. But, <laughs> but, no, but there are people like you that really care about it. And a lot of the teachers I know really care. Absolutely. So, so that really gives me hope. But when I see these young people on the streets, you know, I've been going on Black Lives Matter marches for years. And on the whole, there have been black events. When I see young white people, mm. sometimes they're literally saying to their parents, come on, Dad, wake up. <laughs> mm. You know, that mm. gives me hope, because I know a lot of these young people are going to go on to be teachers, they're going to go on to be influencers. I don't mean that in a YouTube way. You know, they're going to have... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Genuine influence. So uh. That really gives me hope. Trust me, if I thought there was no hope, I just wouldn't be here. I would yeah. just go and live in Jamaica in a shack or something like that, you know. But <laughs> I, really, I, really, I love my country, and I say mm. that, I, I really mean that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm proud of my country. It's, it's, it's like being proud of being black, you know. I didn't achieve mm. being black. I just happened to be black. You know, I'm here. Yeah, I'm I always, born I always in find that. I always find that pride in something that is... I think you can be proud of who you are, obviously, and rightly yeah, so, but it is quite, you know... And things you achieve. And what we've achieved yes. as British people is an amazing level of multiculturalism. Mm. We've, we've done so well that we complain if something goes a little bit wrong. <laughs> mm. You know? And if you forget thinking about multiculturalism as a black Asian thing, about the Celts and the Juts and all the other tribes, I'm sure there's some history teachers here who will know much better than me. <laughs> all these different people brought different cultures. So I find that really hopeful that um, we have people, we have multiculturalism that's kind of ongoing and we have young people mm. that are passionate about it. So another, just another couple, if if we may. So we've had a question coming through that says, um, and I'm sorry, I can't find the the person's name. Um, but she or he asks, as a poet, writer, lyricist, and musician, what is it that inspires you? I'm, I'm sorry, if this sounds a little bit lame, but everyday people, everyday struggles. Um, mm. I'm amazed how we survive. I'm actually amazed that we don't take to the streets even more. I'm amazed that <laughs> we don't take it more. Um, but for most, for, for the most part, we get on with it. And, and, and another version of that question is that people say to me, you know, who are the most inspiring people that you meet? And I say, well, her name is um, um, Mary Jones, and she lives on Arcadia Road down the, down the road there. Mm. Everyday people do amazing things. You know, my sister complained to my mother the other day that her washing machine had broke down. My mother said she didn't have a washing machine. She had to raise eight of us, right? <laughs> eight of us, and hold down the job, and put up with all the racism, you know. Mm. So those, So when I say my mother inspires me, it's not just because she's my mother. It's because I know the stories. When I listen to the stories of Irish people in Britain, some of the things that they mm. had to go through, I mean... Those things really inspire me, and um, yeah, it's it's. Um, I think that's kind of what pulls us together, and that that really has very little to do with top-down multiculturalism. That's not government-sponsored multiculturalism. That's us just getting on and surviving. Mm. And um, there's lots of people asking, lots and lots of questions coming through about, um, you know young writers, young poets that you are kind of, um, uh, that, you, that you've that you seen or, or kind of read that, that you might kind of recommend or that you would kind of be really kind of inspired by who some of the perhaps new, young, up and coming writers and poets that, um, you know, maybe even, as, you know, because obviously you're a um, university lecturer as well as your many other um, Many other strings to your bow. The kind of um, the kind of books and, and and work that you might recommend or suggest to people. Well, it's interesting. I teach so many students performance poetry, and I tell them to go into the world and and cause a revolution, and they end up doing poems for banks in adverts on TV. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you 
<laughs> There's been a lot of that, hasn't there? <laughs> I recognise a few faces on those adverts. What is she doing? What is she doing? Um, it's very difficult for me to kind of pull names now. Um, the, 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 and, and again, I, I, I get very nervous when, when the word young comes in because I'm, I say somebody's young and then people say they're not young. Um, Deanna Roger well, is somebody. Well, I know that's what, everyone, everyone, you know, everyone seems seems young. From my perspective, I'm like, oh, they're young, aren't they? And they're, you know, from a student. Right. Someone on the someone on the chat was mentioning like Raymond Antrobus and some of the um, yeah. performers, poets, and, and written poets. And I know that yes. he's somebody that you've that you're familiar with. Yes, and there's and there's another person who's poetry, a bit like mine in my early days, just works better in performance rather than underpaid, but he calls himself Potent Whisperer. And he'll, right. give a rhyming, he'll give a rhyming guide to the Iraqi war or something, or a rhyming guide to the NHS. And mm. very clever put together thing, but they work better in performance than, than on the page. Um, so, yes, I'm struggling. There's another guy called James Messiah, who was, he right. wasn't actually a student in the Brunel, but I did mentor him there because when I came, he was just leaving. But um, he's also very good. Again, I don't know if he's being published. Um, you know, we, we have to understand that some of the greatest performance poets don't get published. Some of them don't want to, actually, because they know their work doesn't no. really work that great. Um, I was thinking and, uh, that at the big, when you were talking about stories and, you know, oral histories and just stories that are passed down through a more kind of an oral rather than a written form, there is still, there is still, I think, a, a hierarchy almost that the written word and the written story somehow carries more weight or cachet or prestige than something which is performed or spoken, which I've see, always found quite frustrating. This is where education is really important. The oral tradition all over the world, not just in Asia and Africa, was very strong in Europe, and it was what the majority of... Again, I'm no historian, but I know this. In the 15th century, we have the printing press, and then it all goes into... Well, not all of it, but a lot of it goes into print, and then it becomes a kind of... a, a, a kind of us and them. The oral tradition is much... Um, older than the written tradition. You guys know it. But I'll tell you a very quick mm. story that I think is quite something. A teacher was telling me that she was reading one of my poems to the class. And I have to say, I'm not just kind of no. saying this for the sake of it, but she was a white teacher, very well educated, reading, her, reading one of my poems to the class. And said one of her students was just kind of sitting there, kind of like that. And he went, Miss, that's rubbish. I can do better than that. <laughs> and he got up, and without, re without reading the poem, just from memory, he performed my poem. And Do you remember said, which poem you know, it was? He was? It was this poetry. Right. This poetry is like a rhythm that drops. The tongue brings a rhythm that shoots like a shot. And he said, you know, he, knows it, he, he was raised on it, and he knows how to perform it. So I, I do think that we have to try as much as possible to understand that there's a, I call it a poetry. There's a tree called poetry, and it has lots of different branches on it. And no one branch has more value than another branch. It really is as simple uh, as yeah. that, you know. Absolutely. Um, I think we'll probably have to wind up, unfortunately. So I'm going. I'm just looking for one, one maybe final question that might just kind of capture things that are coming through quite a lot. But obviously we've had like so many questions and everyone's saying thank you and how, um, oh, someone's mentioned George the poet who you happened to, um, I think you were doing a podcast with earlier this afternoon, weren't you? I was finished working with him, oh, yes, that's people, right. Some people are begging if they could um, hear you do a little bit more of that poem that you just um, spontaneously went into there. I don't know if that's, uh, if you could, if, is there any chance that you might be able to finish off for people by just giving them a little bit more of this poetry at the end? Yes, of course, I'll do that. Do you want me to do it now? If you don't mind, and then we'll say thank you so much, and um, and I'll thank every, I'll thank you on behalf of everyone for just being such a, a great inspiration to the people in the room and to the, and to the students. But yeah, if you don't mind, that would be a wonderful way to finish. I wrote it because people kept asking me, or, or I created it because people kept asking me, what kind of poetry do you do? And I 
really mm. struggle to talk about it. That's why I felt the need to write it. And and uh, and when they asked me the question, I would just perform the poem. This poetry. This poetry is like a rhythm that drops. The tongue brings a rhythm that shoots like a shot. This poetry is designed for ranting, dance our style, big mouth chanting. This poetry won't put you to sleep saying, follow me like you're blind sheep. This poetry is not party political, not designed for those who are critical. This poetry goes with me when I go to my bed. It gets into my dreadlocks and it lingers around my head. This poetry is with me when I am riding my bike. I have tried Shakespeare, respect you dear, but this is the stuff I like. This poetry is not afraid of going in a book, no, but this poetry needs ears to hear and eyes to have a look. Yes, this poetry is verbal rhythm, no big words involved. And if I have a problem, the rhythm gets it solved. I have tried to be romantic. It did no good for me. I take a reggae rhythm and build my poetry. I could try something personal, but you've heard it all before. No written words are needed because plenty words in store. This poetry is called dub ranting. The tongue plays a beat and the body starts skanking. This poetry is quick and childish. This poetry is for the wise and foolish. Anybody can do it for free. This poetry is for you and me. Don't stretch your imagination. This poetry is for the good of the nation. Chant in the morning. I chant in the night. I chant in the darkness and under the spotlight. I pass through university. I pass through sociology. And then I got a dread degree in dreadful ghettoology. This poetry is with me when I take a walk. And when I am talking to myself in poetry, I talk. This poetry is with me, below me and above. You see, this poetry is from inside me and goes to you with love. I'm going to give you a standing ovation on behalf of everybody else. I just have to check I'd remember to put a full set of clothes on before I stood up. But I say thank you so much. And um, we're so, My so name. grateful for your time this afternoon. It's been absolutely delightful. Um, and uh, obviously we had so many questions from other people, um, but that was wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much on behalf of everybody this afternoon. Um, join me in saying goodbye and thank you very much to Professor Benjamin Zephaniah. See you in school, and everybody. <laughs> no, I'm just going to let him sign off and then we'll move on with the rest of the afternoon. Okay. All right. I hope everybody enjoyed that as much as I did. I thought that was absolutely spectacular and we're completely blessed to have had Benjamin's time for this afternoon. I'm now going to move us on and we're going to hand over to our regular Thursday webinar presenter, teacher Julie Hughes, who's a teacher and English specialist. She's going to give us an overview of the text that we've added on to our new specification, just to give you a bit of a taster. Um, and um, Julie, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Thank you very much. OK, really lovely to be with you today. It's absolutely no pressure following an amazing act like that. Um, just a couple of things, actually, that really struck me there that, um, that Benjamin said. And the first one being the idea of somebody adapting his work. I love that idea, explaining that to students in the classroom, actually, because really that's what we want them to do. We want them to interpret and adapt what they read and you know, bring something really new to it rather than just us explaining to them and, and nailing down that, that meaning, kind of you know, battening it to the wall forever. So I, I thought that was really inspirational. And the idea of um, you know, no borders, I thought that was really, really inspirational. So yeah, fantastic, really thanks to him, it was, it was amazing. It's really lovely that I'm allowed to have my little slot today, actually, because I'm going to talk you through the new texts. I know some of you, you know, you might not have heard of them, you might not have read them, but hopefully I'm going to, going to whet your appetite and give you a little bit of a taster. So let's move on to the first one, which is Coram Boy, which I have to admit I hadn't read till recently, um, and I was surprised. It was published in 2000. It was inspired by something the author heard about the Coram men in the 18th century. Now, he was someone, she heard, that who collected abandoned children, telling their desperate mothers that he would deliver them to the safe hands of the Coram Hospital for the maintenance and education of exposed and deserted children. That hospital was set up by Thomas Coram in London. Now, actually, the hospital never em employed such a man, so it was a myth. But the highways of England were actually littered with the bones of little children. Now, in the novel, the Coram man is, is, is called Otis Gardner. And the story opens in a very dramatic way, with him and his son roaming the country, collecting children and babies. Now, the babies are buried, even one who is still alive. 
which the son has, has struggles with. And then the children are delivered into the hands of slave traders at the docks. The story covers two time frames. It's got Alexander and Thomas at the cathedral school in the first one. And this, in the second, the focus shifts actually to, to the orphans at the Coram Hospital. And what I like about it is, aside from the rich historical detail, which is very interesting about the slave trade and the philanthropic um, charitable institutions and the whole movement of, 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 of charity, really, starting off in the 18th century, it's actually a really gripping tale of family, of courage, of loyalty. Um, and it's, it's at times very gothic with bleak and rain lash settings. So what I thought I'd do, if you just indulge me, is, and I won't be anywhere near as good as Benjamin Zephaniah, but I'd just like to read you the prologue, because I'm, I, I really think that this would be a book that would, would grip you, and the prologue gives you a real taster of the tone, and it's very mysterious. So, a fine lady went to Stow Fair. She was pregnant for the first time and keen to know what the future held for her, so she consulted an old gypsy woman. Why, my dear... I do believe you will have seven babies, said the gypsy woman, studying her hand. The fine lady went away and thought no more about it. When the time came for her child to be born, the midwife was summoned to attend the labour. What have we here, she exclaimed, as she delivered first one baby, then another and another. Oh, no, cried the young wife, remembering the gypsy's prophecy. That can't be so, she wept. Sure enough, one by one. Seven little baby girls were born and laid into a basket. The fine lady was upset fit to die. I, I, I don't care what the gypsy prophesies. I will only keep one baby. Take the other six away, she begged the midwife. Drown them in the river. Do whatever you have to do, but don't tell my husband. And she pressed a purse of silver into her hand. So the midwife took the basket of six babies down to the river. But on the way, she met the husband, a fine gentleman. He heard little squealings and noises. Pray, what have you in that basket, he asked. Oh, it's nothing but six little kittens I'm going to drown in the river. I'm going that way myself, said he. Give them to me, I'll deal with them. Whereupon he took the basket and rode down to the river. When the husband got to the riverbank and opened the basket, what did he see? But six little newborn girls. He frowned, a dark, dreadful frown, then closing the basket, took it away to a secret place. Seven years passed. The gentleman and his lady prepared to celebrate their daughter's birthday and to give thanks to God for preserving her through infancy. They went to a church for a special service. Then afterwards, they were going to throw a, a party to which the whole village was invited. Oh, what should our daughter wear for this special day? The husband asked his wife. Because she was born in October, I shall stitch her a dress of autumn colours, the fine lady told him. Now the little girl's birthday dawned and she was all decked out in nut brown velvet trimmed in red. The gentleman and his fine lady set off the church with their pretty little daughter between them. They sat in the front pew and said their prayers. The organ played, the choir sang. The minister raised his hand to give the blessing and make the sign of the cross, but he was interrupted. The east door of the church swung open. Everyone turned to see who had arrived so late. There, standing in the threshold, were six little girls, all dressed in nut brown velvet trimmed in red. All were identical to the fine lady's daughter. At the sight of them, the fine lady gave one dreadful scream and fell down dead. I hope that's whetted your appetite for that. I found that really chilling. And actually, that ties into the, the events of the story. OK, so, you know, there's, there's some fabulous themes in there and a, and a fabulous Gothic theme um, and tone. But it does cover really interesting historical detail and is just, I think, a fantastic read. OK. Changing the tone a little. Moving on to the next one, Boys Don't Cry. Again, I, I, I really enjoyed this for reasons I didn't expect to. Um, it was published in 2010 to mainly positive reviews. And Mallory Blackman had said, actually, before this book was published, that in most of her books, ethnicity is often not central to her protagonist's lives. She said, I wanted to show black children just getting on with their lives, having adventures and solving their dilemmas, like the characters in all the books I read as a child. And I think, interestingly, in Boys Don't Cry, the family's ethnicity is only casually revealed halfway through the novel. And when I went to write a scheme of work on it recently, I couldn't actually find the, the page where it's revealed. Um, it's got a very striking opening. Um, it's set in the present day, with Dante waiting for his A-level results to come through the door, uh, come through the, in the post. Um, would be very interesting to do it now, wouldn't it? 
Um, instead, he finds an ex-girlfriend um, on the doorstep with a baby she says it's his. What follows is quite an unusual twist then on teenage pregnancy because Melanie, the, 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 the um, girl, claims she can't cope. She leaves her daughter with Emma, with, with Emma, with Dante. Um, she didn't tell him she was pregnant. He had no idea. So here his life obviously has changed uh, just like that. Now, his narrative is interspersed with his brother Adam's, uh, who's younger than him, a character who's openly and comfortably gay, but who goes on to experience homophobia from his peers and, and he's brutally beaten. And what's interesting is Dante himself actually has to admit that he tolerated the, the racism and, and the homophobia and, and did nothing about it. Um, so the novel deals with many challenging modern issues, single parenthood, bullying, homophobia, family breakdown, and it doesn't shy away from the reality of any of them. Um, so I think it's a good one for modern themes. It's, it's really hard hitting in places. So things like tolerance, anger, masculinity, the whole title, Boys Don't Cry, is a really interesting one to think about in modern society, I think, um, because his father it, it comes from the generation where, um, where emotions weren't talked about. So that's that one. And there's some other of the themes there that it deals with, the, the context, the welfare state, single parent families. It's very interesting on the, on the role of the state, actually, because at one point social services get involved. Um, and it is, it, that's an interesting discussion point in the classroom. Moving on, Refugee Boy. I'm not going to talk loads about this because um, Benjamin Zephanas has done it so well himself. But um, the introduction to the play discusses the meaning of immigration and how it is as natural to us as breathing. And it says that immigration is natural to humans. There will be no more, there will be more peace in the world if we accepted it. It explores the idea of immigration and refugees. It's set mainly in the UK. But what's interesting is it going back to what, um, what um, Benjamin Zephaniah said earlier and what the people, like the students on the recording at the beginning said is that it also, diversity isn't really just about handling um, issues of race and issues of immigration and obvious topics like that. It is about bringing the whole diversity of human experience into the classroom. And in the same way that Boys Don't Cry brings modern hard hitting issues there about, um, about family relationships and about the whole idea of sexuality. Um, Refugee Boy brings in you know, topics like knife crime like the judicial system. So it allows a lot of interesting discussions about modern um, current issues. It's a short play. It's hard hitting and it does make you think about the struggles some people endure on a daily basis. So again, we've got themes here, obviously belonging, family, friendship, prejudice, conflict, violence. Uh, and, and as I say, the, the contextual ideas, the idea of civil war, which would be something um, that an awful lot of students wouldn't understand the concepts of, and it, it would be interesting. It's not going to be an area of the world, perhaps, that or an area in history that they're going to actually study. So it's, it, it's interesting in itself. So I, th I think that's a really interesting one to do if you want to do a drama. So now for something completely different, and that's The Empress. I knew very little about this. It was first performed in the Swan Theatre in Stratford in 2013. And it is obviously written uh, um, written recently, but set in 1887. And I think what's interesting about it is it illuminates the side of the 19th century that, that isn't really considered or, or um, covered, and it is that of the British Empire. So if we think it's a really good contrast, actually, to novels like Jekyll and Hyde or to the 19th century fiction, if you do, at Excel, that we study, or indeed the 19th century texts that are studied on the non-fiction side for, for, for AQA, for instance, and, and EDUCAS. Because it is a side that, 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 is, that it forms a ba an important backdrop to many of the events and the feelings of people at home in the UK at that time um, that we don't really talk about. So there's also a focus on the true story of Queen Victoria and her servant, Abdul Karim. And, and what it shows is that although she's really fond of him, and she demands that her rude servants be respectful towards him. She's never been to any of the countries that she rules over and has no idea of any of the damage that the, the empire is, is, is causing. And that is, is alternated um, with, a, with a, a more straightforward story um, or an imagined story about um, uh, 
some Indian ayahs, that servants who came to Britain during the 19th century and their treatment. So again, it, we've got really interesting issues here. Obviously, the experience of Asians in Britain, the Golden Jubilee of um, Victoria, um, the first Asian MP again. So ideas uh, like that that wouldn't normally be be, be silly in the classroom can be discussed. Queen Victoria and Abdul, obviously, um, and um, the treatment of, of, of ayahs from the empire in the UK. So I think that's an interesting one to think about. I thought it illuminated something that is 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 just not usually covered or talked about. It's not something that I have mentioned in a, a great way when I've been teaching 19th century fiction. And then we come on to probably my favorite part, actually, um, the new poetry anthology. I'm really, really excited about this, actually. I really wish I could, I could just dash straight back into the classroom and teach it. Even if, I think the beauty of this part is, even if you aren't going to change to this anthology, it gives you a, a, a lovely, breadth of interesting poems to bring into your unseen and use in unseen. There's a really interesting range. There's themes of lost innocence, the natural world, memories, childhood, as well as the obvious themes of belonging and identity. And what's great is the identity and belonging isn't just approached via the prejudice and, and difference angle. So for instance, there's a poem, um, Peckham Rye Lane, and there's real positivity in it. It's about somebody taking a bus journey and looking down on the people, obviously, in a very in a very multicultural area in Peckham, and talking about the, the different people, and mainly about their hair and their mobile phones. There's a lovely image there of all the people around, around her on the bus um, looking like sturdy hairbrush bristles. I love that idea. The whole, the whole imagery there was, was beautiful. And there's a lovely line in it when the um, narrator of the poem goes past Primark, and it's a couple of lines, knickers lie flaccid in Primark, like salted jellyfish, tentacle pink, and grandmother mauve. I love that. I found that really evocative of another era because nobody uses the word mauve now. I think my grandma once knitted me a mauve cardigan. Um, but the use in the classroom of this, you know, what bus journey can, can they go on and what would they see and what images could they, could they see from the bus? And why Primark? What does Primark represent in society? I think that's quite interesting now. Um, you know, with the, with the shops being open and with the, with the um, Primark being known for being so cheap, where do the clothes come from? There's all sorts of discussions there. And the poem ends with great optimism as well and references William Blake. And there's, there's another poem. I, I love the nostalgia for youth. So I must make sure I don't run over time, actually, because I'm so enthusiastic. Um, in Wales, wanting to be a ta an Italian. And this is a lovely one. I'll just turn to this, actually, um, by M.T. Astarka. Um, and it's about the, the idea of growing up. And she says, is there a name for that thing you do when you're young? There must be a word for it in some language, probably German, or if not, just asking to be made up. Something like Fremdalan this Goran Lust, or perhaps. So it's, what is it called? Living in Glasgow, dying to be French, dying to shrug and pout and make yourself understood without saying a word. Have you ever felt like that? Being in Bombay, wanting to declare, like Freddie Mercury, that you are from somewhere like Zanzibar. What's it called? Being 16 in Wales, longing to be Italian, to be able to say aloud without embarrassment, Bella, Bella, lounge by a Vespa with a cigarette, hanging out of your mouth, and wear impossibly pointed shoes. She reads it, obviously, way, way better than I do, but I love that poem. The whole nostalgia for youth in it is brilliant. And the idea of, of asking them in the classroom... Um, you know, not just teaching it as a poem and not just interpreting it, but the whole idea of what do you want to be? And do you feel, I mean, I, for instance, um, I could say mine would be um, in Nottingham, wanting to be David Bowie's PA. But there you go, that moment's passed. Um, there's also fierce family pride as well in some of the, the poems. And there's a poem called My Mother's Kitchen, which is just absolutely beautiful, if I can find that. Um, a poem, it's a poem about relocating. It was written in 2004, just after the Iraq war. And the poet's parents decided to go home to Iraq after years of being away from their homeland. And this poem is about them packing up their home to move on yet again. And it talks about the mismatched belongings and her mother's total lack of sentimentality about her belongings. And that reflecting, uh, being reflective of their um, lives as, as immigrants and they're moving around a lot. And it starts with a really arresting idea. And the line is, 
I will inherit my mother's kitchen, her glasses, some tall and lean. I won't read it all because I don't have time, but then there's a line that I love. And I, I, I just so would like to meet this mother because it says, at 69, she is excited at starting from scratch. It is her ninth time. What an amazing woman. So I hope that's given you a bit of a flavour. There's also different forms of poetry. I'll just end with this. There's a poem called Jamaican British. And the author had said, um, you can say it's a rap and you can say it's a gazelle. I think I pronounced that right. It's this ancient Iranian form which follows 14 to 17 beats on the line. I love it because it just blurs all those kind of lines about purest ideas about what sound a poem should be making. And obviously alongside these sit more traditional writers, such as Wordsworth. But they are poems that you might not have expected. So, you know, there's, there's some lovely ones there and a lot about the power of nature and happiness and positivity. So if you're doing power and conflict, it would make a real contrast. And on that note, that's, that's me ended for now. I am coming back a little bit later. So I think Katie's going to come back now with a quick poll and then she's going to introduce somebody else to talk to you about diversity. So are you there, Katie? Hello. Ah, Katie has lost her internet connection. She's just coming back. So I will try and re-enthuse about the poetry while Katie's coming back. I'm back. Oh, I'm back. Um, I think my internet got so excited about Benjamin Zephyr, it exploded. And <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, but I'm back. Apologies. Um, yes, I'm here. Thank you, Julie, for giving yeah, us that better overview of the different cats. Just as a kind of taster then, we're going to bring up a poll for you. And I'm going to ask you, based upon that little summary or any kind of thinking you've done so far, which of those newly added GCSE texts do you think you would be most likely to include in your GCSE teaching? So if you could just select one of those texts from there, it may be that you can't actually do it. But just based on what we've talked about, which one do you feel most enthusiastic about adding to your um, teaching? Julie, we can still see you, by the way. I don't know if you know that we can. Not that you're doing anything you shouldn't be. <laughs> so I'm just going to give everybody some time. Can't hear you, though, Julie. We can only just see you. Ah, she's gone. I'm just going to let you all have a little bit of time then to put your answers in. I'll just give you another 30 seconds or so because we've got about half of half of you have uh, submitted your answer by now. Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and show you the answers. So we've got um, lots of votes coming through for Boys Don't Cry. Um, about a fifth of the people in the room think that they might want to do that. But um, interestingly, the Belonging Poetry Collection, uh, romping into an early lead, um, just over 30% of people think that they might like to incorporate that into their teaching. You know, I, um, Julie and I were talking about this the other day. I think that the... The poetry collection is a really, I don't mean this in a disparaging way, I think it's a really easy way of making a positive change in terms of diversifying your curriculum or really kind of promoting that idea of a more diverse English literature curriculum without having to take a step into text that you may be less familiar with or away from text that you are more familiar with because um, the poetry obviously comes in the anthology so everyone is able to get a copy of that for free. Um, it's still following that same structure of 50 poems and seven I think out of the 15 being kind of representative romantic poetry so I really think that that is a great almost kind of first step into looking at a more um, diverse curriculum um, and then it's great to see that there's lots of interest in some of those other texts as well and incorporating them into your teaching so we are now going to move on we have a very packed agenda for you this afternoon um, I'm going to be handing over very shortly now to Lauren Binks 
Uh, Lauren is the Key Stage 5 Coordinator for English and Film Studies at Townley Grammar School. Um, and she has done um, some amazing work with her department on um, decolonizing and diversifying the English literature curriculum. So she's going to give you some um, uh, feedback and views from her experience. So Lauren, if you could turn on your um, webcam and your microphone now, I'm going to hand over to you. Hi. You see Hello. Me here. Hello. Yes, you can hear uh, me. I can't see you at the moment. Ah, there you are. Fantastic. Right, I'll leave you to it then, Lauren. Thank you. All right, thank you, Katie. Um, I'm just going to start by just giving you a little bit of context about my school. So um, I work in an all-girls grammar school, um, mixed in the sixth form, um, in South East London, and around two-thirds of our students are BAME. Um, we started decolonising our curriculum across all subjects, not just English, uh, two years ago. We've still got a long way to go and lots to do. And actually, it's one of our school priorities next year uh, to become an actively anti-racist school. So we're doing loads of work towards that now. And we're going to be looking at that in September. Um, I want to start with a small anecdote as to why I think this is so important. Uh, a couple of years ago, I took a group of students to a conference at Goldsmiths University um, called On Whose Terms, which looked at the cultural power of black British uh, literature and the arts. Um, we attended, there was loads of different sessions going on, and we attended a session that was about the mixed heritage experience, and it looked at um, Amara Santi's film, it looked at Testament's play, Black Men Walking, and it looked at Zadie Smith's novels, uh, White Teeth and Swing Time. The minute that the session was finished, uh, one of my students came to me, and she burst into tears, um, because she said her entire time in the education system, she had never been in a room before where someone overtly articulated her experiences. It's had such a powerful and immediate effect on her because she'd never seen herself represented. Her stories, she couldn't wait to go home and tell her dad all about it. She was really excited. Um, so I sort of went away from that day knowing that we were failing the students because we were telling them one singular, very white narrative. And ultimately, um, we have a really strong belief that every child should see themselves in what they're being taught and every child should be exposed to a wealth of experiences and voices. The more diverse voices we hear, the more we learn. So I went back into school and um, we had sort of four key questions that we used to actually look at our current curriculum and reflect on it. And those questions were, uh, does our current curriculum reflect the multicultural society we live in? What does it define Britishness as? What does it show intelligence to look like? And does it work to present underrepresented groups as other or less than? Um, this is something I don't know if any of you have come across Benny Cara. She's amazing. She spoke at Diverse Ed a few weeks ago. She's a deputy head teacher and English teacher. And she spoke about this idea um, of demystifying the other. She asked these questions to do with your curriculum to get you to reflect on your curriculum. She said, who is missing from your curriculum? Who is voiceless and who is othered? So there are some really key questions that we um, looked at to reflect on what we were teaching the students across all subjects. Um, also, the uh, key thing we did was we looked at student voice. So we immediately created a diversity group and we used the voice within that group to shape the changes that we made. What I asked the diversity to group, very, uh, group to do very early on uh, was to think of any questions that they would like to ask their teachers about what they have in their curriculum and what those teachers teach. And I just want to share those questions with you because I think they're so pertinent and important. So these are questions from our students. So they said they would like to ask their teachers the following. What percentage of what you teach is white male? What representative of the class you see in front of you? Is the white male presented as the pinnacle of intellectual thought? What did you learn at school and what are you teaching now? What does this mean in terms of progress? If you're teaching anything about Africa, do you only look at victim narratives? Do the topic uh, choices perpetuate stereotypes? Do we teach the effects of the British Empire and colonization enough? And do we center a Eurocentric Western curriculum? Are white movements, thinking, and influences seen as superior? So they gave us lots to think about, um, which we then did. Um, Katie asked me to speak today about um, some strategies and some ideas um, that you know I could share with you. So I thought the best thing I could maybe do is just talk through some of the changes that we've made in our English department. Um, so I'll start with Key Stage 3. We had a fairy tale unit initially in Year 7, and we had a look at this and reflected on it, and we changed it to a storytelling unit. 
um, and we used it as an opportunity to explore how stories are told in different cultures. Uh, we look at different forms and traditions of storytelling, ensuring we're avoiding that Eurocentric approach. Uh, one of the first lessons is asking the students about their experiences of storytelling. Uh, we encourage them to talk to their families about their own traditions of storytelling and bring in anything interesting to share with the class about what they've learned about their own cu culture's way of telling stories. We also added in some diverse stories because we realised that before they weren't. Um, so we look at a Nancy the Spider, we look at a Japanese story called Mama Taro, and we're reflecting on this and shifting it even further next year. And we're going to add in um, some stories from Jamila Gavin's collection, Blackberry Blue, where she takes fairy tales and she puts people of colour at the centre of those fairy tales. Uh, we also look at, um, we, you might remember if you've been teaching for a while, that there used to be an anthology called uh, Poems from Other Cultures, obviously very problematically named there. Um, but we use some of the poems from that and we brought those down into year seven and we look at them under the um, idea of identity and social conscience. Um, we also next year are adding in uh, Benjamin Zephaniah's face. So I was really chuffed to hear him talk about it today. Um, in year eight, we taught uh, World War I poetry. And again, this is something that we looked at. We reflected on the fact that perhaps just having it as World War I was maybe a little bit limiting. And so um, we uh, changed it to conflict poetry and we added in some diverse poems there. So we um, brought in poems that perhaps looked beyond that lens. So for example, we look at Choman Hardy's um, At the Border, 1979. We look at John Agard's Flag, um, Dark as the Right Word, just to name a few. I think next year we're also thinking about how we can bring in contextual discussions about the historic whitewashing of World War I and World War II. Um, we, uh, I, I, what I wanted to get across with this in particular, actually, was this idea that you don't have to create entire new units or bring an entire new text for this. You can weave diversity into the current um, modules that you already have or the units you already have. I'll go back to Benny Carr as she spoke about this idea of usualizing diverse narratives and that they should be in the tapestry. I love that metaphor she used of, of education. And, and I feel like you can look and reflect on your current units and see what changes you can make there instead of just um, introducing new units. Um, we also use um, EMC's Diverse Shorts. I don't know if um, any of you have heard of it, but it's a brilliant resource um, as part of our Key Tree Teaching too. In year nine, um, they study a unit on protest poetry, which culminates in them performing their own spoken word piece. Um, this unit includes poems such as Gil Scott Heron's The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, Juice by Rudy uh, Francisco, and Maya Angelou's Still I Rise. Uh, they study Anita and Me by Mira Sayo in year nine, and that brings about some brilliant ideas about cultural identity. And we also have a Shakespeare booklet in year nine that's um, a collection of key extracts and soliloquies. And alongside this booklet, we um, teach post-colonial uh, theory. We bring in non-fiction articles that aim to diversify their study of Shakespeare. So we look at presentation of race, disability, gender, uh, and sexuality within his work. We're also, again, reflecting on that. Um, and next year, we're going to bring in this idea of Shakespeare in film, where we're going to look at diverse adaptations of his work. So for example, we're going to look at Akira Kurosawa's Ran, which is an adaptation of King Lear and um, Omkara, which is a Bollywood adaptation of Othello. So again, a key message hopefully to take from this is that you know, texts that are seen as traditional uh, canon texts don't have to be devoid of diversity. So at Key Stage 4, I have to make a, a confession here and say that we actually currently teach AQA, um, but we are switching to Edexcel, and, we, and the main decision uh, behind that is because they have worked so hard to diversify their texts. But at present, we teach um, AQA. So um, this is, um, we, what, what we did here is we, um, had, we looked at the text that we could uh, teach at GCSE and we decided to teach Pigeon English by Stephen Kelman. Now, we know that's not perfect because this is a black narrative that's written by a white man. But importantly, that is something that we don't shy away from in discussing this in class. Um, we, it, it brings about discussions about gang crime, about racial stereotyping, it's a novel about the immigrant experience, and so we discuss this. We look at the media's presentation of immigrants. Uh, we look at black British history. Uh, we look at the Windrush scandal, uh, the hostile environment policy. Um, and again, uh, just to think about this idea of what contextual discussions texts allow for, and really considering that in your choices. We, our feedback from Year 11 is that they absolutely love studying this text. Um, we also have, we've created a diverse voices, unseen poetry pack uh, to help them with their unseen practice. 
And next year, I'm really excited about this, uh, we are introducing a year 10 identity unit. So this is on the back of um, going to Edexcel's diverse um, literature conference back in November. Um, I think it was Jamila Gavin that said, um, writing is about identifying yourself and exploring who you are. So we're bringing this idea of instead of teaching uh, the language papers as section B, language section B, we're actually teaching it through the lens of a year 10 identity unit. So um, we're going to teach the creative writing, the narrative writing um, and the writing to present a viewpoint through that unit. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to ask them to do a research task where we're going to get them to research their family tree. We get them to interview someone from their family, preferably an older generation, grandparents. Um, and then we're going to get them to research an element of their cultural history that they learn from those interviews. And then they, we're going to get them to bring all that research in and we're going to use that for them to shape their own creative and narrative writing around that. So they're engaging with their own cultural identity or whatever, you know, their identities as a whole. And then for the nonfiction side of that, we've sort of chosen to do this idea of using your voice to speak about what you're passionate about in terms of your own identity. Um, so again, they'll be bringing in that research um, but we're going to use nonfiction articles and essays to shape ideas. So a few texts that we're going to use are Akala's Natives, Rena Edda Lodge's Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, um, It's Not About the Burqa by Miriam Khan, uh, Lekes Shukla's um, The Good Immigrant, Feminists Don't Wear Pink by Scarlett Curtis, and uh, David Olasaga's um, Amazing Guardian articles that he does. Um, so Katie asked me to speak about Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4, but I'm just going to really quickly talk about A-Level because we do um, Edexcel at A-Level and we've made some changes here as well. Um, so we, uh, we, for the coursework text, we teach the colour purple and with that, because it's a comparative piece, we created a, an anthology of diverse texts to complement it, um, encouraging them to choose that, um, uh, a text from that anthology that we created. And as part of our study of Alice Walker's text, we look at white feminism, we look at uh, Walker's Womanist Manifesto, black stereotypes with particular focus on uh, the presentation of uh, black masculinity in the novel. We look at uh, discussions on victim narratives and the white saviour trope, depictions of Africa in the media and post-colonial ideas. Now, even though that's wonderful, uh, a really key thing is that we've actually got student feedback on that. And we felt that some students felt like it maybe fell into the sort of victim narrative a little bit. And so we're actually going to change it up a little bit this year, uh, next year, sorry. And we're going to teach Girl, Woman, Other by uh, Bernadine Evaristo, the amazing Man Booker winning uh, text. And we thought that there was something really powerful about teaching a black British narrative to avoid always looking to America in this regard. Um, and it, obviously, it's a brilliant text about the diversity of the black female experience, about generational, spatial, geographical boundaries. And the comparison text that you can do with it can maybe be more contemporary, therefore. So in the anthology we've created, we've got Sadie Smith's work, Chiamanda Ngozi Adichie's work, uh, Arundhati Roy, uh, Andrea Levy, and we've got poets like Roger Robertson and Raymond Antrobus. Um, so hopefully that's going to be a really positive change. Um, and then across all key stages, uh, we've created uh, reading lists that have been really carefully curated to think about that idea of diversity and, and inclusivity. Um, and our library has been brilliant at supporting us in that as well. And then just a really quick sort of easy win as well to think about is do you think about your displays, the images on your resources and your PowerPoints and the names you use in writing, etc. Uh, in your example, example writing. So I'm just going to finish today. Uh, by just talking about perhaps if you are thinking about doing this and if you are thinking about decolonizing your curriculum, it may, it may be the case that you come across a few naysayers. Now, this, this isn't my experience. I have a few, but overall, it's been really positive. Um, and I just wanted to uh, respond to that, really. So um, one question I got asked very early on with this was, uh, what about the white students? Uh, to which my answer is, what about them? Um, every child should be exposed to a wealth of experiences and voices, and the more diverse voices and uh, narratives, the more we learn. The other um, issue that was raised is, uh, you know, but what about Inspector Calls? It's a work of genius. Or what about Shakespeare? Um, and yes, of course, these texts have stood the test of time, and of course, they're still really important and brilliant. But I think we have to question who decides what writers are worthy, who decides what makes the English canon. I think our curriculum is a hangover of colonial ideas about what worthy looks like. And I think we have to actively question these things in order to f fully decolonize our curriculum. Thank you for listening. 
Thank you, Lauren. That was absolutely fantastic. And I think that's a really um, important point to leave on. It really speaks back to that quotation right at the very beginning of this evening's webinar where we were saying, you know, it's a question of choice. Things do not get onto a curriculum. It's like, you know, what's in a museum? Things are deemed worthy of being kept for a particular reason. Things are deemed worthy of being kept, of being put onto a pedestal of a specification of a, being part of a canon for a particular reason. And that's kind of got social, political, and all kinds of ideological kind of motives. And I think that there were some absolutely fantastic tips in there. Um, and there's been so many people coming up through the, the group chat saying, um, oh my goodness, can we get this kind of in writing? So just for those people who haven't seen what I put in the group chat, Lauren wrote an amazing article in Nate magazine all about this experience that we'll send out to you because I only have it as a PDF, so I can't put the link in the chat. So we'll send that PDF out to you as part of your post event um, materials that comes out to you. Uh, Lauren's on Twitter. I put her Twitter handle in the group chat, but it is, um, I don't know how to say Twitter. Do you say at? Is it at? At Miss Hegley, H E G L E Y. ENG for English, so at Miss Hegley English. We'll put that in the group. Maybe one of my colleagues who's in the background can pop that back into the um, group chat again so that it's right at the top for everybody. But thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, what I'm going to, if you yeah. don't mind, Lauren, turning off your microphone and your camera, um, just so that um, you don't sort of pop up when you're not expecting it. Fab fabulous. Um, I'm now going to invite everybody in the group chat, based upon what Lauren has just said and that kind of quick overview that she gave of what she's been doing in her school with her team, I would love it if everybody could put in the group chat one thing or um, one thing you might change, one thing you might do differently, inspired by the ideas that Lauren has shared with us this afternoon. Um, it might start going pretty quick in the group chat, but don't worry, we'll make sure you get copies of all of these um, ideas for you to, um, to have afterwards. So don't worry, but everyone, if you wouldn't mind, one thing that you're going to start doing differently or might look to implement in the group chat, please. And I will just give you some, some time to, uh, to put your ideas in. Yeah, so we've got loads of great um, suggestions coming through, people talking about their schemes of work, people talking about ensuring that the student voice is um, recognised as part of um, the curriculum being developed, looking at this idea that Lauren mentioned around, you know, who is being othered? So I guess... Um, when we think about others, we, we're kind of applying a default norm. So, you know, if you're not the norm, then you are an other. And what does that really tell us about the kind of things that we um, consider to be um, different? Um, so we've got um, lots of suggestions here about um, pupils doing their own research, researching their own cultures or different cultures within their classroom or their community, um, adding in diversity to some of the more, um, to some of the... Um, things you already have around war poetry, um, around, I think, this point about um, it doesn't have to be a complete sea change. It can be about looking at what you do currently and looking at ways of um, expanding and diversifying the content that you already have. So loads of really good um, inspiration coming through from there, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, yes, looking at Key Stage 3, because obviously um, there is somewhat more freedom at Key Stage Three in terms of the um, the text that you can include and the approaches that you can that you can take. So um, don't worry. Like I say, if you didn't catch everything, we'll make sure that you get that link that that copy of Lawrence Nate article. People have also asked about the um, the questions that one can ask oneself about you know your own curriculum. So we we'll make sure that you get copies of those as well. But now, just for the sake of time, I am going to move on. Um, we're going to bring Julie back. Julie is going to now get into some more of the practical nitty gritty around incorporating these additional texts into your curriculum and into your classroom. So we're really going to look at um, teaching strategies, teaching tips and resources. Um, so Julie, I'm going to bring you back and hand over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. <laughs>
how difficult this is. I started doing webinars, what seemed like years ago, but was only, um, I think, about 12 weeks ago. And I remember being terribly, terribly nervous. And I can honestly tell you, that was smooth as silk. That was amazing. Thank you very much. And loads of really exciting ideas there for everybody, which I know people will appreciate. One thing I think really resonated with me there was the idea that if we are truly going to be diverse and embrace that, then we need to be inclusive. And I think that's part and parcel of it. So the idea of asking the students instead of just dictating down to them, I think is, is was the, the, the main thing I took away from that. I thought that was amazing. So I'm gonna kind of bring you down to work a little bit now. If you come to my webinars regularly, you'll know that um, I know that you like a little resource to take away. So hopefully you'll be able to take away some other practical ideas. Now, all that I'm gonna tell you now can be adapted for any of the texts you're doing. But what I wanted to start with was, um, again, staying with the idea of inclusivity, that I like to think about the big questions and um, asking big questions in the classroom and, and, and valuing students' ideas about them. So here's just a couple of big questions that I would start with, inspired by the books that on our new books. So should boys cry? That's a really good one to ask in the classroom. I found that was a fascinating discussion. Um, are we responsible for the sins of our fathers? So the idea there of the, the, the slavery. Is Britain still a world power? I, I think you'll find depressingly that most students will say that it is. Who should decide how children are raised? What I like especially is which is more important, maths or music. In Coram Boy, there's a, a central plot line with one of the characters about him not being allowed to carry on with his music. And interestingly enough, it's the wealthy boy that is not allowed to carry on because the expectations of the, the aristocratic family are that he follows the, the, um, the lineage and, and, and carries on with, with the father's profession. But it's a very interesting discussion there, particularly in the light of, of, of whether what text should go on the canon and what is worth studying. Okay, so these are my four ideas, and I'm going to do them very quickly because I know we haven't got a lot of time left. Um, I want you to consider these four areas, really, with whatever text you, you study in, in terms of literature, is focusing on the big questions. A very important one to me, anyway, is valuing students' prior knowledge. It's something I've covered in past webinars, but I think it's very important. Integrating context. I'm not a great fan of starting off with research projects. I think it just leads to lots of information about Shakespeare's second best bed and Dickens having um, grown up in the marshes, etc., and it's just bolted on. So I like to integrate it. And I actually like to get the novel to teach the context to the students, as I'll show in a moment. And also, I think it's really important to value students' judgments, which I think, again, is something that came across there from, from Lauren very clearly, was that we need to listen to the students and value what they say. And I think the beauty of taking on a new text, I know it's scary if particularly trying to... Um, at this point in time, taking on something new might be quite frightening. But the beauty of it is you can hand over a lot of the interpretation to the students and it can be fresh. There is a tendency with the, the text we've studied for a long time for it to be a very top-down process in the classroom. So, OK, valuing prior knowledge then. Instead of telling students about the book, let's find out what they know. So here are some questions, for instance, if you were teaching Coram Boy, what do you already know about slavery? What do you already know about? orphans and orphanages. What, what do you already know about scholarships? And what this does actually is, is, is it values them. It values what they already know. But it's also a really important way of correcting any misconceptions, which actually might not be um, apparent at all. They may keep those inside. But what do they think about private schools? Because that crops up in the book, the whole idea of, of, of the public school system. And it enables you to, to address any misconceptions there. But you then know what they're bringing to it and what their feelings about it are. And you can build on that in your interpretations, which is really useful. So another carrying on with this, really, with, with the idea of, um, of valuing them and coming to it differently from the kind of research project way is sort of interesting roots in. And this is from a scheme of work that I did for Boys Don't Cry. So it's just different ways into the, the novels and texts that don't involve go away and find out about when the Titanic sank, um, that, you know, more interesting roots in. Um, this is another way in as well. What do you think about? I do a lot of these grids in the classroom with either phrases in them or words in them. And this was for Refugee Boy. Again, the idea of, of just giving them the words. What do they make you think about? So let's, let's understand in the classroom what immigration means to them and what it means to you. What does Ethiopia mean? Is it still just the, the, the classic um, 
live aid sort of a starvation country or, or do they know more do they know nothing what does asylum mean what's its wider meaning so that the, the unpacking of these important concepts before you actually read the book and also before you go away and, and research um, a more classic way to go into into the books and and um is to is to give them the themes and and, and just do a picture matchup activity which is obviously straightforward but if you were to do this, for instance, with um, with Coram Boy before you read the novel, again, it's getting their their ideas. For instance, I've matched up courage with the with the um, with the medal there. Obviously, there are different there are different ideas about courage that you can unpick, and that this enables them to ask questions about what kind of courage will be in the book if that's the picture that I've chosen. Okay, you, you can also as well give them that as a homework and get them to pick their own. Um, pictures to go with it, which I found really interesting there. What symbols would they come up with? I hasten to add that I am bound here by the Pearson Asset Library, so sometimes the pictures I use to give to you aren't the most imaginative. Um, sorry, Pearson Asset Library, but you can be a bit dull. Again, here's Boys Don't Cry, the idea of masculinity, you know, what does it mean to be a man? Does it mean, you know, you're pumping iron? Um, th those kind of ideas, that, that's fairly straightforward. You can use it in all sorts of ways, just as a springboard for discussion. What would they have as a picture for masculinity today? Does it mean anything to them at this point in their lives? Um, here, there's another one where I've put more pictures than there are themes. And um, this is Refugee Boy again, I think. And it's, a, um, again, you know, pictures that they can, they can link to it or not, um, or bring their own in. And again, it's a good spring, a springboard for um, discussion there. And then here's another idea, um, integrating context. So um, as you can tell, I'm not that keen on the research project idea. It, it is interesting, Coram Boy in particular, for instance, is that the book itself will give you the context because the book, if you read it, will teach you what you need to know and you can go away from those springboards. Okay, so the idea of what do you learn here and what more do you need to know? And this is about the um, young um, Toby who is um, fostered by a, a freed slave. So again, the idea that there were freed slaves in the UK. Um, you learn about his mother being in America and about his fear of being taken away um, as a slave. So you learn those things, but also what more do they need to know? For instance, they might need to know what wet nursing is. And they might, if they do know what wet nursing is, be surprised that somebody who was fostered by a poor family would indeed have been wet nursed. So that whole idea there, it's all in the pages, you know, use that. Um, I will whistle through the next few. This is another way of doing context is to, um, is to give them some facts, either in advance and get them to comment on them, not link them to the book necessarily. What, what, what does that make them think of? What do they think the book is going to be about? And you can also do that throughout the book. You can use it as a, as a, a, a project at the end, um, giving them one, and here's one for Boys Don't Cry where you give them some just some short prompts, interesting ones, um, and they have to link it to a very specific part of the novel. Again, that all helps with stopping them just bolting context on as an extra paragraph to their essay without actually linking it to the text. And I'm going to end, really, on, on what I call a judgment sheet, which you might just see as a... Well, I'll link, show you those links there. Um, uh, one of my great filling the white space um, ideas that I've shared several times before in my webinar. Now, this one I, I was calling a judgment sheet, okay? And this is Refugee Boy, the, just the plot around the sides. But I've used these in the classroom. I've shown them in advance, actually, and got them to comment on it. But the judgment idea being, you know, which is the most interesting part of the plot to you? Which is the most exciting? Another quite powerful one is to ask them what, what would prompt them to read it? What part of that plot would prompt them to want to go away and read it or see it. And if you want to keep the text exciting, you can leave the ending off. But that idea of valuing their judgment again, well, I would be interested in this part of it rather than dictating to them what the most exciting part is. And obviously, this is a great revision activity as well. You can use that. You can put a, a theme there and get them to link very specific parts of the plot. What you might do as well is leave key crucial parts of the plot out and, 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 and obviously see whether they, they're going, they want to bring those in. And that really is, is all from me because now we're going to, I think we're going to, to end.
with another video. But thanks ever so much for coming. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it interesting. I certainly have. So I'd like to pass my thanks on to, to Lauren and to obviously to Benjamin Zephaniah. Thank you, Julie. Um, thank you very much to you also for all of those kind of really, um, really great tips. Um, there is, um, I think we are going to, uh, let me just skip on to the next slide because I think I might be stuck slightly behind. So um, I have just got a couple of questions for everybody and then we're going to play out with, um, with some more insight from another teacher. Um, so I was just wondering if I could ask you, um, based on this evening's event, how likely do you think you might be to include one of these new texts in your teaching from this September. So if you wouldn't mind just popping your response to that poll into the um, into the poll on your screen, that would be fantastic. I'll give you a minute and then I'll publish the results for everybody to see. just give you another couple of seconds to pop your um, answers in there. Okay, so let me publish the results of that. Very exciting. Um, so we've got over half of you, just over half, um, saying that you're very likely to include one of the new texts in your teaching from September. I think that's absolutely fantastic. And then another 33% of you saying that it's quite likely. Um, I'm wondering maybe if some of the people who were undecided or not likely, maybe 2020 seems like, you know, too much to get ready in a short amount of time. Um, so um, maybe 2021 might be something that you are thinking about. But what I wanted to do would be to ask people who are not sure about incorporating one of these texts into their teaching, what is it that might be stopping you? And I put some suggestions up here in this poll that we thought could be reasons why um, you might not be thinking about being able to incorporate these texts from this September. So if I could please ask you to um, reply to that poll as well, and then we can see perhaps what some of those concerns are just in case there's anything we can do to help you to overcome it. So we've got some of the responses coming through now. I keep forgetting that you can see me because when I uh, when I have the poll up, I can only see the poll. I can't see myself. So I hope I wasn't picking my ears or anything <laughs> that I shouldn't have been doing. Um, so let me just publish the. I'll give you ten seconds just because there's a few um, a few responses that haven't come through yet, and then um, I'll publish the results of this poll as well because I think it gives us quite an interesting insight into um, what some of the barriers that people feel they might they might have are. So we can see that um, money is a potential problem, um, but the one that's come through most strongly is um, concerned about um, lack of time. And um, we've also got there um, in not being your decision. Um, I think that if there is anything that um, you know, if there's any kind of lack of lack of willingness or lack of engagement within your school to perhaps make some of these um, positive changes, then you know, share the share the feedback from this event with them. Share the article that I'm gonna um, send out to you after the event that Lauren wrote about her experience at her school with them. You know, if there's any way that we can support you in influencing your um, SLT to help to make some of those decisions, then I'm very happy to try and do that. Um, lack of time, I guess, is um, obviously a concern. Um, on the Edexcel web page, and I'm sure one of my colleagues behind the scenes will be able to put links into the group chat, we have schemes of work, we have um, knowledge organisers, we have recorded lessons um, for the new text to give you a really um, useful, hopefully, uh, jumping off point um, into um, getting going with these new texts. 
And even if this September is looking a bit punchy, bearing in mind that we are now kind of in mid-July, then definitely things for you to start thinking about for, for next year. So just, um, just to end, I'm going to let you know that there's going to be some uh, feedback that we're going to ask you to do. Um, you're going to be sent a link, I believe. I'm just checking um, that. Oh, it's on the last slide. I was just checking with the background info that my, that my colleagues were sharing with me. So on the last slide, um, there is a link that you can um, fill in some feedback. So we would absolutely love to have your feedback on this event. Um, find out um, what you felt has worked well, anything you'd like us to do differently, anything you'd like us to do again. And we really, really would love to hear from you. All those of you who have been with us through Julie's kind of last 12 weeks of web webinars will know that the, the feedback just doesn't go into a bucket and then we ignore it. We genuinely do engage with that and try and make our next series of events um, reflect your feedback. Um, in all, um, to, to kind of wrap up this evening's event, um, we are going to hear from um, the curriculum leader for English from Hollyhead School, Malika Sahonta. And she has shared with us some of her reflections, again, on the experience of diversifying the curriculum at, um, at Hollyhead. And this is how we are going to end this afternoon's session. So before we play that video, thank you so much to everybody who has joined us this afternoon. Thank you to Julie and Lauren and Benjamin Zephaniah and to all of you for engaging. We hope you have enjoyed it. And I'm going to leave you with um, some reflections from uh, Malika Sahonta. Hello, my name is Malika Sahonta and I'm the Director of Learning for English at Hollyhead School. Our school caters for a multicultural, multi-faith student population and I realised very early on that the English curriculum should be used to empower students to understand their background and their identities as well as others. We needed to go beyond tolerance and create a culture of acceptance and celebration of diversity in its full range. The whole purpose of literature is to share our unique experiences and therefore by diversifying our curriculum, we are nourishing our students' understanding of the world and making students understand that there's a place and need for their voice and their contributions. If they recognize themselves in the characters that they read and the authors they study, they are more likely to enjoy their learning experience, become engaged and feel empowered to become writers in the future. Recognition can be taken for granted by society, but for these students, Recognising themselves in literature is an important part of feeling valued by the society that they live in. So we put together a curriculum that ensures that students see themselves in literature. Their voice became central to our mission. And with that in mind, we began to plan a curriculum around teaching what matters in line with our school ethos. We diversified the authors we use, such as Andy Stone with The Hate You Give, Noughts and Cross Crosses by Mallory Blackman, as a reader lesson. With year eight reader lessons, we've used My Sister Lives on the Mantelpiece by Annabelle Pitcher, Wonder by RJ Palacio, and so on. We've also brought in the play Curran Boy by Jamila Gavin as a reader lesson. We've used Face by Benjamin Zephaniah, and Dapo Diola was used to come in because he's an illustrator and he created a book about a young African-American girl who loves space. So our students got to see that they can really think about careers and options that they, weren't normally, they wouldn't normally think of. We've also brought in Orange Boy to tackle some of the gang issues that we have within the local area. This year, we've decided to bring in um, the Empress for our year nine cohort in order to show them that diverse literature by a playwright who is from a unique background, a Bengali Indian background, which actually means that they get to see a nuanced understanding of India and its peoples. As you may have noted, that we've used a variety of experiences in order to build on our students' understanding of the world. This text in particular provides a unique opportunity to talk about colonialism and colonialism and its nuanced impact on society today. Students get to understand that their ancestors contribution to British society, but more importantly, feel that they belong to the society through this contribution. The old curriculum was rigid. It was, it was now important to embrace the contribution of everyone to modern British society. As Gove changed the curriculum to British values curriculum, we need to understand that these writers are part of a diverse British canon and thus need to be taught to our young people.
I hope you that you will consider making these adjustments like we have, and we can sincerely say that we see a huge impact in our results, student motivation, and connection with teachers who have shown empathy towards their students and their identity and their place in society. Thank you for listening.